Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thanks for um, tuning in or, or coming along. Uh, to, tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, some recent developments in dynamic mooring analysis for ships and uh, got a few different topics um, I'm going to be talking about. Okay, can you just ask everyone to type in their questions in the chat? Okay. Yeah, Candice reminded me if you've got any questions, uh, please type it into the chat um, and we'll have a look at uh, them at, at the end and, and, um, and we can talk about them. Okay, so the, the topics uh, we're going to be talking about are um, firstly, what should be the simple case, which is uh, a moored ship at an open trestle berth with no wave reflection uh, and just open water wave conditions. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, a harbour where oceanography meets naval architecture. Then we'll talk about side-by-side uh, -side, uh, ship motion problems, um, 12 degrees of freedom, which um, I'm told is 11 degrees too many. And then we'll talk about how to do long-term simulations with uh, dynamic, dynamic mooring. And uh, we'll go through the number of core hours required uh, to do that and, and you'll see um, why we uh, went to the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre. So just the limitations that there's a few different effects on uh, moored ships, uh, but we're going to concentrate on waves, which are the dominant forcing uh, in most WA ports. Uh, wind loads um, should be noted are also critical for cruise ships uh, and container ships. And currents can be important um, at some of our ports, such as Port Hedland. So I thought I'd start off just with a, a video. Uh, some of you might have uh, seen this before um, of um, a Panamax bulk carrier uh, in the port of Geraldton. And this is sped up 32 times. But if you just watch those uh, stern lines and uh, watch the gangway, you'll see the sort of movement you can get uh, in port. And uh, this is um, on a, a flat calm day, no, uh, no wind or um, and uh, only a, a moderate swell. So um, firstly, let's look at um, an open uh, trestle berth, um, the, the simplest case. Uh, there's a classic uh, test case, um, Van Ort Merson's PhD thesis from 1973, um, where we did a bit of validation uh, against that case, a, a 200,000 deadweight tanker and at, a, at an open berth. Um, pretty simple mooring setup you'll see there, just uh, four mooring lines and two fenders. And um, it was a, a nice test case because uh, he went through uh, the um, radiation uh, problem, the added mass and damping. Then he went through the diffraction problem, uh, the wave loads, and then he looked at uh, the resulting uh, motions and mooring loads. So you'll see uh, the graphs there on the right, um, which are the WAMIT calculations in the blue uh, line and uh, the model test results, uh, the black dots uh, for the sway damping coefficient and um, the sway um, load RAO in VMCs. And you'll see that WAMIT does a pretty good job of um, predicting both of them for this uh, simple case. This is just an open water case. And we went through and um, then fed all those uh, loads into more motions, the time domain solver, and compared with uh, the measured motions. And the findings, um, firstly, it's important to note that um, for these moored ships, uh, the natural horizontal motion periods are very long. So generally between one and three minutes. Um, so uh, especially surge can be quite long uh, and uh, sway normally a bit shorter. Uh, but um, very long um, natural motion periods. So um, as you might imagine, any um, area where you have uh, long waves present is going to be a problem for moored ship motions. Also, um, shorter period waves uh, can be important uh, when you get uh, second order effects um, taken into account. Um, so that's the first point. Second point, um, moored ship motions are not sine waves. Uh, if you imagine uh, the fenders and the mooring lines, often the fenders are about 50 times stiffer than the mooring lines. So rather than a nice um, sinusoidal motion away from the berth and then into the fenders, it's a slow motion away from the berth and then a very quick 
bounce off the fenders. So the motions don't look like um, sine waves at all. So frequency domain uh, modeling falls down. Um, if you have double the wave height, you don't have double the, the motions. Um, it's all very uh, nonlinear. Um, but uh, on the plus side, as soon as you dispense with trying to linearize everything, um, it opens up new possibilities. So anyone who's done a bit of sea keeping analysis and tried to fit a um, linear roll damping uh, coefficient uh, will know that um, it's, it's often quite tricky to do. So if you can specify any external loading you like, it, it really opens up new possibilities for increasing the accuracy of um, the modelling. And um, so there's various different um, radiation diffraction codes. Uh, we use WAMIT, uh, which we've found uh, to be very good. It, it, it um, gave uh, very close results to uh, the model test results for that test case. And uh, we use a time domain solver, um, more motions written in MATLAB, uh, which uses a runga kutta um, time stepping method. And um, that, that was seen to give um, uh, time domain motions and loads, very similar to um, the model tests. Another important point is um, a lot of um, the development of WAMIT and Hydrostar and other codes like this has been about offshore structures and they're quite different to a ship moored at a berth. Um, a ship moored at a berth, you've got a lot more mechanics going on with the fenders. Um, so you've got more complication but it also works in your favour as well because you've got uh, more mechanical damping um, and mechanic, and that tends to override uh, the wave drift damping and those tricky sorts of second order effects uh, that the offshore structures have to deal with. Um, so uh, it, it kind of becomes easier in a way um, for a ship at a berth when we're building in these extra effects. So as you might expect, uh, the swell and the long waves are generally the most important for moored ship motions and that came out in that Van Ortmersen uh, thesis, uh, long waves especially, which are a shallow water effect. Um, so as uh, swell waves come into shallow water, um, the, the long waves um, increase. So in, in the shallow environment, they can become especially important. And short period seas can also be important. So even though the, the wave period is a lot shorter than any of the natural motion periods, uh, once you take the second order wave loads into account, um, even a, a large wind swell um, can have quite important effects, effects on a moored ship. So the next topic we're going to look at is uh, um, a moored ship in a harbour. And uh, this is a very different situation to a moored uh, ship in open water. So we mentioned that for open water, you can be operational up to one and a half to two and a half metres uh, significant wave height. Uh, whereas uh, in Geraldton Harbour, which is shown here, um, you're typically only operational up to about 15 centimetre long waves. So very small waves can uh, produce very large dynamic loads on the ship. So Geraldton's a, a nice example of this, uh, studied all around the world um, because it's quite a rectangular harbour and a lot of um, sizing going on um, within the harbour. So amplification of long waves within the harbour. And you'll also see there from this uh, bird's eye view that uh, it's a complicated wave pattern in the harbour. So you've got um, key walls, you've got corners at different angles. Um, the waves are different from the bow of the ship to the stern of the ship. And it's, it's not so much uh, that you can set a specific wave direction, um, that it's almost like wave-induced currents going around the harbour because it's such a complicated wave pattern. So the initial impetus uh, for this uh, um, coupled ship and harbour method uh, came when we were um, doing some modelling at berth seven, um, the Carrara iron ore berth, and we realised that the bow of the ship, I'll just... Um, Get the laser pointer on. Okay. Yep. 
So this is berth seven here. So we realise the bow of the, sh the ship is out in the incoming swell, um, whereas the uh, stern, of, stern of the ship is in uh, more protected water, but close to this corner where you've got these, this flow around the corner. So a very complicated wave pattern uh, at that berth. And uh, we realise that uh, we, can't, we can't set a single uh, wave direction. Even what's often done with um, having a ship next to a key wall and using the reflections from the key wall um, can't be done here. So um, we ended up saying, why don't we just mesh the whole harbour and, um, and study the ship and the harbour together. So uh, this is um, what we did to um, mesh the whole ship and harbour. In that um, diagram there, you'll see that um, this red line is the dipole mesh of the whole inside of the harbour, going all the way around here. And we've got uh, swell waves coming in from the north here. So, uh, and then you can have a ship at whichever berth that you like um, and mesh that. And um, we're lucky that we've got lots of good uh, measured wave data uh, in the harbour. So we can either set uh, wave conditions outside the harbour as like open water wave, wave conditions, or we can tune those wave conditions based on the measured uh, data um, at the berth or at the wave gauge. Um, and then we can calculate uh, the first and second order wave loads on the ship uh, using uh, WAMET um, in this case, uh, the impulse response functions, and we put in the um, external effects like the fenders and mooring lines, um, they can all be non-linear, and then calculate the six degree of freedom motions uh, using the time domain solver. So here's an example mesh um, for a ship at berth five, as you, as you just saw there. So the ship is uh, meshed using a standard uh, surface mesh of a couple of thousand uh, panels up to the waterline. And the harbour is meshed using a dipole mesh uh, around the outside of the harbour. So if you, you think of waves coming in from the north uh, there, the, we're really interested in what goes on inside the harbour. Um, we realise that what happens outside the harbour um, doesn't matter uh, so much for the ship, for the waves um, uh, diffracting around this uh, mesh. So um, it's an almost fully enclosed harbour where we can have uh, the, the waves within the harbour and the wave loads on the ship uh, calculated. So here's an example um, time domain simulation at uh, berth seven using the coupled ship, coupled ship and harbour method. So uh, this um, simulation shows the waves within the harbour as calculated uh, using WAMET. Um, it only shows the long waves, uh, 25 seconds as above and above, um, and as it's um, clearer to see what's happening with the waves there. But you can, you can see with all the different wave frequencies uh, and all the different uh, wave directions within the harbour, it's a very uh, complicated uh, wave pattern within the harbour. And now zooming in um, to the motions of the ship, um, you can see when the mooring lines are under high tension, uh, they go red, and you can see the, the sway and your motions um, of the ship there. So this is sped up, you'll see the times on the top. Um, so the ship um, coming completely off the, the fenders sometimes, um, and uh, high loads uh, in the, um, in the mooring lines. And we had some measured uh, data at birth five, uh, which we used for validation of this method. Uh, it was an interesting uh, story the way it came about. We were doing underkill clearance um, uh, measurements in the channel, and uh, we were, would measure the um, motions of a ship on the way in and then on the way out. And we thought, why don't we just leave the um, equipment recording while it's at the berth uh, and get the moored ship motions uh, at the same time. So we ended up getting some really nice moored ship motion uh, data from our supposed UKC trials. So this is Sea Diamond, a Panamax um, iron ore carrier at berth five. And you'll see the mooring arrangement there. 
So we had uh, the measured wave conditions during the validation trial. So the reason we chose this one is that this was the last ship in the harbour before they closed the harbour with a new uh, swell front coming. Uh, so normally for this berth, berth five, uh, the limit is 12 centimetre long waves and it just ticked up to 13 centimetres uh, just before departure. So uh, it was a nice case with uh, reasonably, uh, so conditions right on the limit basically. So we chose a one hour time period uh, for analysis. And the, the, measure, the motions were measured uh, using three GNSS receivers on the ship and one on the shore, on the pilot jetty. And so we had one on the bow, one on each of the bridge wings. Uh, you'll see on the photo on the left shows the receiver on the bow. Uh, the photo on the right shows the receiver on the um, starboard bridge wing. Uh, and that photo was taken on the way in on, on Sea Diamond. Uh, and you can see that the, the swell is just uh, coming up there. And so with this arrangement, uh, we get um, uh, motions accurate to 10 to 20 millimetres um, when it's post-processed. Uh, so very accurate ship motions. Um, we didn't have, and Geraldton still doesn't have um, uh, load measuring bollards, so we didn't have the mooring line loads uh, to validate. We only had the, the ship motions. And so you'll see here uh, the, the measurements and the predictions. And because we didn't have the the um, mooring line loads were used either a half tonne or a five tonne pretension and assume that, uh, that the actual pretension in the lines was in between those. And so you've got the six degrees of freedom there, surge, sway, heave, roll, pitch and yaw. And the GNSS measurements on the, in the right hand column. So um, peak to peak surge, 1.88 metres, peak to peak sway, uh, 1.17 metres. Um, heave 0.19 metres, roll half a degrees and so on. And uh, you'll see that the surge um, using the half a tonne or five tonne were, were either side of the, the measurements and similarly for the sway. We've also got the frequency domain uh, results there, uh, which we can use for the vertical motions, um, heave, roll and pitch, uh, but we certainly can't use frequency domain for the horizontal motions. Um, but frequency domains are pretty good approximation um, for the vertical motions, um, but it doesn't take account um, of uh, fender friction on each of those um, motion components and second order um, wave loads. So anyway, you see that the, the, the uh, comparison's normally pretty good. The yaw was the only one that was uh, um, under predicted. And I think that's because uh, when you look at the wave, um, uh, modelling and measurements. Uh, there was a, a peak in the harbour um, uh, sighting at a similar period to the natural yaw period, which was uh, slightly under predicted. So that may have translated into under predicting the yaw. And uh, as I mentioned, we didn't have uh, measured mooring line loads, but this is uh, interesting just to see the effect of pretension on the mooring line loads. So when you go from half a tonne to five tonne pretension, uh, that extra four and a half tonnes doesn't translate it into an extra four and a half tonnes of dynamic loads. So it only, in this case, um, translates into an extra one or two tonnes of dynamic loads. And when you look at even more extreme conditions, often uh, the, the low pretension um, case has got higher peak loads than the, than the higher pretension case. So when you've got higher line pretension, you, you're keeping the ship on the fenders more and increasing the, the effect of fender friction um, in damping the motions. Now let's move on to um, the topic of side-by-side -side, uh, ship motions. And I'll just show you this uh, example video. So this is um, uh, iron ore transshipment, um, uh, sped up eight times. And you'll see uh, the relative motion, the larger ship not moving much, um, but the smaller ship uh, moving a bit and the resulting relative motions uh, between the two. So this is what we want to be able to predict. A few examples um, of side-by-side -side ship mooring um, in practice. Um, 
bulk transshipment, uh, such as um, the CSL operations at Wyala and Cape Preston, uh, upcoming um, new operations at Balla Balla and Marty, Marty Salt will also be um, side by side transshipment. Also, uh, floating LNG, um, for example, uh, Prelude um, and uh, crude oil transfer, been going on around the world for many years, um, uh, ship to ship. And uh, nowadays, uh, LNG bunkering is also under investigation for um, ship, uh, ship to ship. Uh, side by side in open water. Uh, just a, a note on the operability limits that we're trying to stay beneath for um, side by side motions. Uh, typically, both uh, P and CAN and OPIMP um, recommend that your mooring line loads shouldn't go above half of the minimum braking load. And uh, obviously, the fenders can't go uh, to their rated compressions. Um, the roll amplitude is often an, a limiting factor um, and three degrees is a pretty commonly used uh, limit for uh, both vessels um, and that's for dry bulk or LNG um, uh, ship to ship. There's um, also relative motion limits if you're looking at uh, LNG hoses um, and the actual limits depend on, on the setup there. And there's normally a wind limit as well. So to um, keep your motions beneath these limits, you've got a few options for how it's done. It, it can be, um, for example, if it's a bulk carrier, it can be anchored. Um, and if it's um, something like Prelude, it can be turret moored. Um, also slow steaming is an option. Uh, slow steaming has the advantage that you can keep uh, the bows into the swell. Uh, whereas anchored, you're just uh, spinning around with the wind and the current and, uh, and sometimes you beam onto the swell, which is uh, normally not um, advisable. The mooring lines can be used or dynamic positioning can be used for, for ship to ship. And um, it can be either side by side, which is what we're talking about here, but just wanted to mention that uh, tandem uh, bow to stern is often, is also very common um, for crude oil transfers. So for side by side, ships, um, it's a, a nasty 12 degree of freedom uh, problem. And so um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the modelling. Okay. So we've got um, the first and second order wave loads on the coupled system, uh, calculated using WAMIT or Hydrostar or Diffrac or NEMO or um, another radiation diffraction uh, code. And uh, the impulse response functions as well, the coupling between um, certainly the, dip, the, the two ships, um, Sway and Yaw, um, impulse response is quite important. Uh, gap resonance is something that happens. Um, you may have seen uh, some videos of gap resonance uh, between um, uh, ship to ship uh, transfers, where you can get quite large waves um, in between the ships. And uh, so that's something to look at. Um, then um, you can put in your directional wave spectrum. Um, you can put in your heading if it's a, a weather vaning um, situation and your um, fender and mooring line curves and then uh, solve the 12 degrees of freedom um, with a time domain solver. So here's just a um, simulation example. Uh, this is in the frame of reference of the larger vessel and you'll see um, the relative motions between the two ships here. And firstly, uh, something to note on the, the mooring arrangement is, is tricky with side, um, side by side ships. It's hard, to, it's hard to get long resting lines. So it's, it's difficult to get um, good uh, resting restraint on the ships. Um, so it's uh, hard to keep the ship, hard to keep the ships uh, on the fenders. Couple of examples of gap resonance. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, bulk transshipment um, on uh, smaller vessels with a two meter gap at the top or larger vessels with a four meter gap um, down the bottom. Um, and you'll see the difference in the, the gap resonance. So uh, the vertical scale is the wave heading um, using zero is following seas, 90 is starboard beam seas. Um, so if you look at 180, which is head seas, 
you'll see that with the two metre gap um, between five and six seconds, um, you've got uh, large res resonant uh, wave motions in the gap. So according to the, the, um, the basic theory, up to 12 times the, the basic wave amplitude. And for the larger um, ships with a four metre gap, uh, larger defenders, we've got um, a resonance at between um, six and eight seconds uh, and um, around eight times the, the wave amplitude. So as you can imagine in the calculations, uh, when we're getting large waves like that in between the ships, uh, it produces correspondingly large uh, wave loads on the ships. Um, so when those gap loads are important, you really have to have a look at, um, at what's going on and, um, and whether it's realistic. The relative uh, sway damping is really important with side-by-side uh, -side ships. So um, a model test case uh, from 2001 at Marin uh, showed that the linear sway damping uh, was insufficient and uh, they used a correction, um, uh, an, an empirical correction with a viscous damping um, coefficient. What we uh, looked at was um, the uh, second order effect um, from the jet outflow when you've got two uh, large wall-sided ships uh, moving together. Um, and when those two almost vertical walls move together, as you can imagine, you've got a, a jet coming out all around. Um, and um, that's a second order effect. When you look, look at um, the Bernoulli um, theorem for the, for the pressure in that, um, in between the hulls. And uh, you can do a, a pretty simple Bernoulli analysis um, by equating the jet uh, pressure uh, to the, the um, ambient pressure and give a quadratic, um, a quadratic effect of that um, um, relative sway damping, which is very small um, at uh, low velocities, but at, as the velocities get larger, it, it uh, becomes um, more important as it's a second order effect. So I mentioned uh, previously that um, the 12 degrees of freedom can get quite nasty when you're solving that uh, in the time domain with, with uh, quite a lot of coupling between all the different degrees of freedom. Uh, often in the early days, you'll, you'll have uh, 10 to the power of 100 um, surge uh, amplitudes and stuff like that, um, because there's um, stability issues that, that can happen. So some um, important factors for the numerical stability is you need a really short uh, time step, um, typically 0.1 to 0.2 seconds, even if you're looking at uh, motions of um, 50 to 100 seconds natural periods. Uh, we need a, a really long time span on the impulse response functions to make sure they've really gone to zero. Um, we may need to remove some of the cross coupling uh, terms in the hydro static restoring matrix, uh, they can cause problems. And uh, if the two ships are similar size, it's often not so much of a problem, but if there's one, for example, uh, one uh, iron ore carrier and a, a small bunker vessel, um, the, you can have the case of the, the tail wagging the dog where the, the, the small vessel um, produces unrealistic motions of the large uh, vessel. So sometimes you need to decouple, for example, the small vessel heave. Um, another thing we've done a lot of research into is uh, energy dissipation uh, by the fenders and the mooring lines. So uh, fenders aren't 100% um, uh, uh, energy return and uh, mooring lines aren't 100% energy return. But when you um, build in energy dissipation into the model, you can get uh, spurious modes um, cropping up when you've got a large number of degrees of freedom. So that's another um, thing to, to check for. Here's an example uh, validation case for side-by-side for -side ships. Uh, this was done at, at Marin with an LNG carrier next to a wall in head seas, uh, which is representative of uh, two identical LNG carriers at uh, double that distance apart in head seas. So it's just a head sea case and it's equivalent to four metre gap uh, between the two. And um, we did some validation on the new version of WAMIT, version 7.3, uh, with or without a damping lid. You'll, you'll see in the mesh there that you've got uh, the two holes meshed and the damping lid meshed in between them. 
So firstly, um, the mesh de dependency, how fine a mesh would, should we use for side-by-side -side ships? Uh, it's a bit different to a single ship because um, when the ships are close together, say four metres apart, you want uh, the mesh size to be small relative to that uh, gap distance. So generally you need a, a finer mesh uh, than uh, in open water, which is a big problem because you've already got double the um, number of panels from having the two ships. So uh, we did a, a mesh dependency study and um, for a, a thousand panel mesh, a 2000 and a 5000 panel mesh, and we found that um, from 1,000 to 2,000, there was a, a fair change, but from 2,000 to 5,000 was pretty much identical. So probably about 2,000 panels is, is probably the minimum for side-by-side um, -side, um, uh, ships of this type. For the wave loads, which were measured um, at Marin in these model tests, that's the black line uh, you'll see there. And we've um, plotted uh, the um, sway load, RAO, in the top graph uh, against wave frequency. And you'll see that at low wave frequencies, up to about 0.8 radians per second, which is an eight second period, uh, then um, very close agreement with the model tests. And it doesn't matter whether you're using a damping lid or not. So the damping lid really becomes important at the higher frequencies uh, when you've got that gap resonance occurring. And now looking at the motions, uh, we've got three uh, plots there. Firstly, the sway up at the top. Uh, secondly, the roll uh, in the middle. And thirdly, the yaw down the bottom. These are all REOs, uh, so measured motions in the model tests are, are shown as the black dots. And uh, you'll see generally um, close agreement. Um, so blue, again, is uh, Wamut without the damping lid. And red is Wamut with the damping lid. And so they're the same at lower frequencies, but at the higher wave frequencies where resonance, gap resonance becomes important, uh, you'll see that, that that damping lid really damps down those, those peaks. So the last topic I wanted to talk about was um, long-term simulations. So just some numbers on an, on an example um, calculation. So let's say uh, you wanted to do um, a five-year hindcast of side-by-side -side ship motions um, uh, every hour. And so you had a full directional wave spectrum every hour over that time. So that's 43,000 sets of um, input uh, conditions. Uh, you might be looking at two loading conditions um, of the smaller vessel. Uh, so 87,000 independent one hour simulations. The good thing about this is it's what they call embarrassingly parallelizable. Um, because each um, case is completely in independent. So you can just send them to whichever cause uh, you want to, to do it. So it's not like a big CFD calculation. But um, each one hour simulation takes about 400 seconds on a single core. So um, about 10,000 core hours per site. And you may be looking at multiple sites. So um, yeah, on a standard workstation, you're looking at months to do that sort of project pro problem. So um, we spoke to the Pawsey uh, Supercomputing Centre um, and uh, they were very uh, helpful. Uh, Gino in the, in the picture there with me uh, had been um, doing a lot of his PhD research um, on, at the Supercomputing Centre anyway um, and, uh, and helped uh, with this. So um, they gave us um, eight nodes, each of 28 cores, and um, that cut the time down to 40 hours of computation time. So depending how big your project is, um, is, is how much they'll allocate to you. And uh, you can knock over these sorts of um, simulations uh, within a matter of days. Okay, just a bit of further um, information. Um, those um, um, research reports are publicly available um, at the Perth Hydro uh, site if you want, want any further information. And now ready for questions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we first take questions from um, the and then we will uh, read out the questions we get in chat and then we can answer them. Okay. Yeah, any questions? Yuri? Um, Thanks very much for the presentation. The question I had about the risk of 
exploding and these visitors I did dumping and all, and all that. And one of these ideas is really something to mention to this over. So how, how are the visitors also uh, taken into account and how they work? Okay. So um, for role, for example, for that uh, Geraldine validation, what we did was used uh, the Akita method for um, the viscous roll damping, and you can add that into WAMIT as an external damping when you do it in the frequency domain. And so those frequency domain results included uh, viscous roll damping. Um, you can also include it um, in the time domain modelling in the same way. So you just put it in as an external um, damping. No viscous, um, no viscous damping included for surge or, or sway. So, well, um, that um, the side by side that uh, gap uh, jet, that's a viscous effect. Um, but for the single ships, no. Um, the basically the the fender damping is so massive in com in comparison to the second order uh, effects, hydrodynamic effects that I think they can be neglected. Not for, a, not for a floating offshore uh, uh, structure, but for a ship with fenders when it's all very mechanical. I think, yeah, the mechanics don't dominate. Yeah. Um, general, the question to general, uh, sure. Uh, so yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, that, that question was from Yuri Drobyshevsky on uh, how viscous uh, damping was included. Yeah. Next question. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tim. Thanks for the stuff. Just before I ask my main question, uh, you said that the jet effect was a viscous effect, but you're using the moon to create the solid effect. Yep. So, yes, so that was uh, Kim Clark asking about the jet effect um, being a viscous effect, but you use Bernoulli's equation. Yeah, so with a jet, you uh, set the, the pressure of the jet to the ambient pressure, but with the increased velocity. So that means that the pressure with, between the ships at, at low speed is a lot higher by Bernoulli's equation. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the simplified jet model. That basically the jet comes out at high speed, but um, ambient pressure, and then just loses all its energy through viscous effects. Okay. Yep. And my main question. <laughs> yep. Uh, going back to the, the ship in the harbour, uh, with those waves moving around inside the harbour, they create their own currents. And I'm wondering if you can't just look at it as a current effect instead of a wave effect. Yes, well, it's kind of the same thing uh, hydrodynamically. It's it's just water moving at a certain pressure, um, and so as far as the hydrodynamics goes, it it's it's kind of the same thing, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But it's um, treated as inviscid, whereas uh, uh, proper current um, proper current calculations are uh, you know done as often as semi-empirical, uh, like uh, wind tunnel type. So how is the seabed model? Uh, just constant depth in Wamut. No friction. Uh, no, no friction. Yeah. The actual flow velocities are pretty small. So yeah. Yeah, that was actually my question about the uh, <laughs> whether or not it was uh, the depth was modelled in, in harbour simulation. Um, but um, uh, I think I remember. I'll just mention that, Ken. So Ken just um, was also talking about um, the the constant depth. That, that's, a, that's a major thing. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a trade-off. So if, you, if you're an oceanographer, you would do this problem using the variable depth um, and you would get more accurate um, calculations of the waves within the harbour. So what we do is we try and use a bit of oceanography. We tune, we, we realise that um, setting a constant depth isn't so accurate. So we tune the actual waves to match either the measured or the, the fun wave predictions, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, obviously, uh, a lot of ships are going to be very close to the seabed there. So uh, yep. again, the effect of the, um, the, the ship and the sea bottom would be uh, quite significant so that it's all on damping in, in all different uh, modes. Yes. Yeah. So um, Ken's question was um, the ship's very close to the seabed, so the, the damping effect uh, will be very important. Yeah. So um, for um, sway damping, for example, yes, um, the depth the depth is taken into account, but only in an inviscid sense. Yes. Yeah. But even in viscid, um, you've got a, la a large amount of hydrodynamic uh, sway damping um, from being that close to the, the seabed. 
Side by side and chip transfer. So you're actually having uh, is this great two chips as you more and then steam together? Is that yes. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So Ken just asked about whether slow steaming was uh, generally preferred uh, for ship to ship uh, transfers for uh, crude oil um, transfers, such as in West Africa. Um, they're normally done by slow steaming, as far as I understand, and keeping the bows in the swell. So slow steaming gives you the control basically over your heading. So if it's a, 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 um, a long period swell, um, you can just point the bow straight into the swell and a lot better than into the swell. So um, being anchored is, is obviously ha has advantages as well. So for example, if you're looking at uh, bunkering, then you can uh, bunker the ships while they're waiting to go into the harbour. Um, so um, from a time point of view, that works quite nicely. Uh, but uh, from a hydro hydrodynamics point of view, if the ship's swinging around with the current, um, there'll be a certain time in the, in the tide cycle where you beam on to that swell and, uh, and things can get nasty. And it's typically uh, currents which are moving the ships around and not um, prevailing winds? Or yeah, uh, it depends on the location. So in the Pilbara, for example, often the, the currents are quite strong and, and uh, they can often dominate. Um, but when the when the breezes are strong, the, the winds will do, will dominate, uh, and and waves affect. So you can get um, you can you can calculate the heading um, over a long uh, time period using a, a weather vaning analysis. Uh, and um, just the tricky uh, cases come where you've got wind against current, and and then the heading can change quite quickly. Yeah. Any more questions? We have a question from Mike. Um, has all your validation work been uh, has been limited to hydrodynamic responses, or have you also validated mechanical responses through load monitoring or similar? Okay. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Forgive. Yeah. So mainly on the hydro. You'll have to unmute. Okay, so that question was on where, whether the validation is all on um, hydrodynamics or on mechanics as well. Um, we've done quite a bit with, um, so, uh, with mechanical type moorings such as the short tension units in Geraldton. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of measured data there which we've used um, uh, to, to validate um, actual uh, line, measured line tensions um, and ram extensions of the short tension units. So that's um, a nice mechanical uh, case. Um, the short tension uh, guys have been um, very helpful with uh, modelling uh, their units. Um, as far as the actual mooring line loads, yeah, most of most bulk berths um, uh, aren't don't have load uh, monitoring, um, or the LNG berths tend to. Um, but um, we haven't done any um, uh, validation against uh, those measured. Um, line loads uh, at an LNG berth. Um, so yes, it, it's mainly been uh, either model tests or, or full scale um, and using the motions with the uh, GNSS receivers. Next question is also from Mike. Uh, it says, um, it seems that Geraldton Port has been studied to death by a multitude of researchers. Has any progress or improvement derived through analysis or ever been implemented? Or has it just supported operability limitations? Okay, so that question was um, about Geraldton and uh, that it's been studied for many years. Uh, that's right, and it's well known around the world. Uh, they had a big uh, technical symposium uh, in 2016 uh, with researchers from all around the world um, come to Geraldton and, uh, and do some analysis on uh, the moored ship 
uh, emotions in the harbour. Um, I, I'd like to think that we've made um, an improvement with this coupled ship and harbour method. It seems to give um, pretty good results uh, and we've recently used it to do a five year hindcast um, at three of the berths uh, in Geraldton um, and use, using that uh, to, to help refine uh, the wave uh, limits uh, for the port. So I think we're getting somewhere, but um, but yeah, certainly uh, a long way off of solving it. Um, it's it's a, a very a very tricky uh, problem um, there. Uh, and uh, but lots of ideas um, have come up in the past and will continue to come up um, for Geraldton, uh, which which is great. They used to use um, tractors to um, tension the lines, and um, they've used uh, used all sorts of things over over the years. So. So it's an excellent case study for uh, moored ship motions. Uh, we've got another question from Alistair uh, saying, thanks for the presentation. You mentioned using 50% MBL mooring line loads as a criteria for evaluation. How much of this is to account for safety against line wear, protecting the bollards bits in the system versus accounting for uncertainties, assumptions, in the modeling. Are there any other safety factors typically applied in calculating acceptable forces? Uh, for example, fendering pressure on hull. Okay, so that, that question was about the 50% uh, MBL uh, being used um, for the uh, peak mooring line loads. Yes, yeah, so that's um, PIANC and OCIMP uh, recommendations. Obviously, as soon as uh, the lines get worn, um, the MBL uh, change, changes. And, um, and so, um, yeah, that, that value that's used is, is quite important. Um, for example, um, the LNG terminals will often use a lower value, such as 40 tonnes, um, uh, which is less than 50% of the, the braking load as a, as a limit. Um, so um, there are different limits used that, that are lower than that in practice um, and with um, yeah, so each port will set their own, own limit that they're comfortable with uh, but in the modelling it, it, it normally comes down to following that as, a, as probably an absolute maximum um, safe, safe value. Um, so as we all know um, mooring line breakage is, is a major safety issue so um, snapback zones and snapback barriers um, are a very important uh, part of, uh, of ship mooring and, um, and being pretty conservative um, when it comes to um, uh, peak mooring line loads. We've got another question from Mike. Uh, has anyone ever studied actual pretensioning? 0.5 to 5? Uh, T routinely possible, or is it just a convenient and analytical st starting point? Also, no surprise on the pretension sensitivity. Thus, curious as to refining the actual relevance. Okay. Uh, so that question was about. Uh, So that question was about the pretension. Uh, five tons is is commonly used uh, for modelling studies. In fact, uh, PIANC recommends that if you're doing this sort of um, modelling analysis, five tons is a good value to use. In practice, uh, mooring lines generally aren't tendered that well. Um, if you look at uh, Geraldton with the, the ships uh, being loaded and the tide changing, it's impossible to tend the lines well enough uh, to keep uh, that uh, level of pretension. So often in practice, the, the pretension is a lot lower. Um, and as, as we discussed, um, as soon as you, you're missing um, the pretension, the ship's coming off the fenders more uh, and generally higher motions and sometimes higher peak loads as well. So uh, for example, in Geraldton, it's one of their big things to keep on at the ships about, about tending the lines to keep the pretension up. Mm -hmm. We've got another question by Jalal Shahraki. Um, hi, on long-term simulations, why not use long-term wave statistics rather than modeling for six years? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, that was that question was about um, doing a long term uh, wave, uh, a long term um, dynamic mooring study. Why don't you just pick the, the peak um, values, for example, and, and study them? Uh, so, um, yeah, res I think the buzzword nowadays is uh, response based analysis, isn't it, Yuri? Yeah. OK, so it's <laughs> it's uh, often uh, difficult to work out what are going to be. Uh, the critical conditions in advance, especially um, if you're looking at, say, a weather vaning case where you've got the ship heading changing uh, every hour, and then you've got the um, the wave spectrum changing, uh, so different wave heights and periods and directions, and currents and winds. It's it's pretty much impossible to do a, a joint. Well, it, it's not impossible, but in my view, it's actually easier to just study everything and then work out all your statistics afterwards. And that teaches you a lot about, you know, what really are the critical conditions uh, rather than trying to work that out in advance, where, which is um, quite a, an easy way to make a mistake. Thank you very much. So um, again from Mike, uh, Cape Preston, for example, seems to have a long history of mooring line failures during ship-to-ship -ship mooring transshipment Anecdotal, uh, anecdotally, it would seem in a seam analysis would be unable to assist due to the multitude of inputs and more operational assumptions not readily analyzed without doing a doctorate at the client's expense. Do you not see the future of analysis with respect to side by side mooring operations better served from within calibrated bridge type simulators where the operational inputs can be seen and consequences? We have often found it relatively straightforward to moor vessels with limited accuracy, but the real challenge appears to be getting the vessel alongside and away without overloading mooring failures and hurting people. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so that um, for a ship to ship transfer, the actual tie up and let go is, is very important. And, and that is, um, where mooring lines can fail as well. So yes, you're right, um, ship handling simulation uh, is needed and, and is used um, for actually bringing the ships alongside uh, and, uh, and letting go and the order of um, attaching the lines and all that sort of thing. So yeah, good point. Yeah, uh, a bit more about the harbour modelling. Mm -hmm. um, is it add a lot of complication to have multiple ships simulated in the harbour in that type of um, uh, analysis, that kind of analysis that you do? And uh, what degree uh, is being also simulated to, from acting on the boring lines? Okay. okay, so that was that question was from Ken Go um, about the harbour simulations, um, whether when you're doing uh, multiple berths, uh, you do uh, multiple ship meshes, uh, and secondly, about um, how winds model. Um, so if you're looking at ships at different berths, what we normally do is to just do one ship at a time, um, unless the ships are very close to, to each other, they can probably be um, treasured independently. Um, if some of the some in some cases you can have ships quite close to each other, but we haven't actually had a look to see how it varies um, with a ship next door or not um, on the on the uh, wave induced motions and loads. Um, but yeah, generally, if you've got a few thousand panels uh, for the ship and another few thousand panels uh, for the harbour, you're getting up there in terms of computational um, uh, grunt anyway. Um, so adding an, adding extra ships would, would blow that out pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, um, you mentioned some testing uh, with Marin. Mm -hmm. Do they also do similar type of uh, analysis in, uh, in the tank, where you were able to also validate uh, the results of this uh, uh, panel? Yes, it, it, um, so that question was about the model testing. Was this for the side-by-side um, -side case that you're talking about? Uh, no, it was actually for the harbour oh, case, that. whether or not um, the two methods had been 
Yes, I haven't um, haven't done any validation against model tests in a harbour, um, but yeah, and haven't seen a good test case uh, to do that. Yes. And also, how do ships get on if they're in a, um, say, a 30 foot uh, tidal zone? Yes. Uh, are they able to get on if they're in a tidal zone? Yes. So that question was from Hugh uh, uh, about self tensioning uh, winches and how that affects things. As I understand, um, if um, there's any risk of large mooring line loads, the self tensioning winches are actually locked off. Uh, so they're uh, because otherwise they, they can just keep paying out. Um, so I think, as far as I understand, um, that's what they do at Geraldton. Has anyone got any comments on that? I think they're normally locked off, so they're not, they're not, not actually uh, self-tensioning once you get into, because they're, I think they're, um, they automatically pay out at whatever it is, 30 tonnes or something, and uh, they're stronger to, to actually lock them off, as far as I understand. When, when they're in waves is, is what they do. Um, sorry, what, and what was your second question? What do ships do when they're in a 30, say a 30 foot uh, tidal range? Yeah, and second question was what do ships do when they're in a 30 foot uh, tidal range, uh, such as uh, broom? Uh, yeah, co constant tensioning of, of, of the lines. Um, but yeah, um, and it, it can happen uh, pr pretty quickly. Ideally, the, the PAINC guidelines say that your, your mooring lines should be close to horizontal. And if that's the case, then it's not too much of a problem. Uh, but um, often that's not the case. So often the, the, the ship's fair leads are, are quite high above the berth. And if the, um, if the bollards are on the berth face, you can, you can be up at quite a large angle above horizontal. And that, that's when you really notice the effects of the tide. Okay, thanks everyone.